on behalf of New America. Thank you for joining us today. I think it's a very timely topic um, to have this discussion. So Matt's going to actually introduce us, so I'll just turn it to you, Matt. Thank you, Suzanne, and, and welcome, everyone. Thanks for being with us and for those watching online. Uh, thanks for joining us today. My name is Matt Duss. I'm the president of the Foundation for Middle East Peace. Um, and we're really, really pleased to be working with the New America Foundation and glad that they could host this panel. I'm looking forward to the discussion uh, very much, as Suzanne said, uh, very timely. Um, uh, trying to achieve a nuclear deal with Iran has been a key item in, pre in President Obama's foreign policy agenda, going back to when he was a candidate. Um, I think it's important for a lot of reasons, but it also, I think, demonstrates and exemplifies some of the ideas and principles that he's brought to American foreign policy, working within a multilateral framework, advancing America's security uh, through diplomacy, using all the tools uh, in, in, in America's toolbox uh, to advance uh, America's security and the security of our partners. Uh, so with that, let me just give a brief introduction of our panelists. To my left is uh, Alan Goldenberg. Alan is currently a senior fellow and director of the Middle East Security Program at the Center for a New American Security. Uh, but prior to joining CNAS, Elon was the Chief of Staff to the Special Envoy uh, for the Israeli-Palestinian Negotiations at the U.S. Department of State. Um, prior to that, from 2012 to 2013, um, Elon served as a Senior Professional Staff Member on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee covering Middle East issues for Chairman Kerry and Menendez. And then before that, from 2009 to 2012, Elon served as the Special Advisor on Middle East and then as the Iran Team Chief at the Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Policy. Uh, to Ilan's left, Suzanne DiMaggio. She's a senior fellow and director of the Iran Initiative here at the New America Foundation, focusing on, on New America's growing body of national security work. Uh, based in, 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 in New York City, uh, she leads a program on the future of U.S.-Iran relations, looking at Iran in the context of the broader region, emphasizing ties to Gulf states, India, Pakistan, Afghanistan, and other major players. Uh, before that, uh, Suzanne served as the Vice President of Global Policy Programs at the Asia Society, uh, setting the strategic direction for the society's work in the policy arena. To Suzanne's left is Shlomo Brahm, a uh, visiting fellow with the National Security and International Policy Team at the Center for American Progress, uh, where I worked uh, until August. Um, Shlomo's work focuses on U.S.-Israel relations, Middle East security issues, and the Iranian nuclear program. A, a former brigadier general in the Israel Defense Forces, he's also a senior research associate at the Institute for National Security Studies uh, in Tel Aviv. His most senior post in the IDF was the director of the strategic planning division in the planning branch of the general staff. Uh, so if I could, first, why don't I just, I'll go to Shlomo, because I think the title of this, this discussion is the U.S., Israel, and the regional implications of an Iran new nuclear deal. I think there's clearly been some tension and, and disagreements among the leadership, Prime Minister Netanyahu and President Obama and other members of their administrations over the Iran nuclear negotiations, uh, the strategy, the approach. Um, some of the concessions that I think Netanyahu has seen the P5 plus one have made, um, and he's criticized those. What did you make of the Israeli response to the extension of the JPOA? Thank you for letting me participate in uh, this event. Uh, basically, the United States and Israel are on the same page when it concerns uh, the nuclear program of Iran. Neither of them want the Iran to have uh, military nuclear capabilities. And also on other aspects of Iranian uh, policy and uh, Iranian alti attitude, there is complete agreement between the, the two sides on uh, uh, opposition to, to the way Iran is uh, giving support to, to terrorist groups like uh, uh, Hezbollah and Hamas. Uh, 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 opposition to the, the dismal record of uh, Iran uh, in human rights, etc. And what uh, the two states also share is hope that sometime it will be different. Uh, because I, I don't know if uh, Americans are aware of that, uh, but uh, the, Israel, the basic Israel attitude to Iran is different <coughs> from the attitude that Israelis have to, to the Arab states. Because with the Arab states, we have a conflict 
since uh, the establishment of the State of Israel. Uh, with Iran, we knew good times. And there is always, always uh, the, the, uh, uh, the wish to return to these good times. And uh, uh, I can uh, say that, for example, when Israel is uh, considering different uh, uh, violent operations against Iran and its interests, there is always also the consideration, uh, do we want uh, to, to, uh, to create a blood account with Iran? Well, we want to come back to, to, to a positive relationship. Uh, and because the two states are uh, on the same page, uh, through the years there was a, a level of cooperation on this uh, subject that was unprecedented. I, I can, uh, for example, mention the, the cyber war that was waged against the, the Iranian uh, 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 nuclear program, the famous case of the Stuxnet uh, worm or virus or whatever you can call it. Uh, uh, well, we of course d do not know uh, the details, but generally it is believed that that was the, pro the product of very close cooperation between the two states. Nevertheless, we, we often hear about friction between, uh, between the, uh, the, the Israeli government and between the United States administration around the Iranian nuclear uh, program. And I will try to explain what are the sources of this friction. Uh, I will use uh, the name of a book that once was very popular, uh, popular. I think it was very popular also here in the United States. It was called Men are from Merch and Women are from Venus. Uh, and what I will say is Netanyahu, the current Prime Minister of Israel, is from Merch and Obama is from Venus. And there, there is a, a problem of building trust between these persons because they are so different. One of them in Israel is right wing, his, his world view is composed mostly of threats that he is concerned of and less of hope that something good will happen sometime. And Obama is exactly the opposite. He's liberal, he's progressive, he's full of hope, he always talks of hope, he always uh, talks, we yes, we can do, etc., etc. Uh, while Netanyahu usually think about the things that we cannot do. So there is a problem <coughs> to build <coughs> trust and understanding between these these two people. But not only uh, Netanyahu and Barack Obama are from Merch and from Venus. Israelis are to some extent from Merch and Americans are from Venus. Uh, also, I think most Israelis are more optimistic than Netanyahu is. Uh, there is also this tendency, A, to focus on threats, and B, uh, to make the calculations uh, that bring about uh, development of policies based on worst case analysis. And the case of Iran is typical. Iran with the nuclear uh, 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 weapons is an existential threat to Israel in the sense that, that uh, nuclear weapons uh, can destroy the state of Israel. Of course, they can destroy also Iran. And that can be a basis to some possibility of living with a nuclear bomb. But it's very difficult for Israelis to consider that. And because of that, Israelis want to be completely certain that once an agreement is reached, uh, Iran will not be capable of, uh, of, uh, 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 of making further progress with the military aspects of its nuclear program. And here, uh, there, is, uh, this, uh, there are strong disagreements between Israel and the United States. Because the current negotiations of the United States are uh, based on the premise that what the United States want to achieve is to lengthen the breakout time 
namely the time that it takes for Iran from the decision to go now quickly to uh, nuclear weapons until they get the first nuclear weapon, uh, to lengthen this period from few months, which is the situation now, to at least two years, possibly more. And the declared policy of Israel, because they want to move the West towards this place, is that, that Iran should not have enrichment capability at all, which means even more than two years of breakout time. Uh, while uh, the premise of, 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 of uh, the present uh, negotiations is that what the P5 plus 1 want to achieve is a breakout time of uh, one year. So what it means is that even, an, uh, of course, it will be coupled to his very thorough monitoring and verification uh, uh, arrangements that will enable uncovering that that's what Iran is uh, starting to do, and then doing something to prevent it. Now, uh, uh, that means that even if the, there will be an agreement, Israel will say that it's a bad agreement. But then the real question, and now I am getting to the Israeli reaction to the extension of the, of the interim agreement, is what Israel will do when, uh, when it will happen. Because saying that it is a bad agreement and uh, saying something uh, that will not be so nice about the US administration and uh, President Obama, well, they are already used to it. Uh, but the question is whether Israel will do something substantial. So I think what we can learn from uh, from uh, from uh, the Israeli uh, from the extension example that the, the the initial Israeli response to the agreement was extremely negative. I don't know if you remember that, but uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu presented it as, uh, as uh, something like the worst agreement since the Munich Agreement and a disaster, and so on. And that was based on this kind of worst case analysis, on the assumption that because of that, the sanction regime will collapse, uh, Iran will cheat, etc., etc., etc. Neither of these things happened. Sanction regime did not collapse. In my opinion, eventually, Iran got of the, the sanctions were, that were lifted basically less than it opted for because of different reasons. I don't want to elaborate too much. And Iran didn't cheat. It complied very well with the interim agreement. So what happened, actually, is that the Iranian nuclear program for the first, uh, for, uh, the first time for, I think, more than eight years, nine years, something like that, was frozen and even roll, rolled back a little bit. And because of that, the attitude of Israel changed completely at the end of these uh, nine months. Mm -hmm. And now, not only that Israel didn't think that it is a bad agreement, the interim agreement, but actually the Israelis were asking the US administration to extend it as the preferred option. And my feeling is that uh, something very similar will, uh, will happen with, uh, with an agreement. The initial approach will be very negative, but that doesn't mean that Israel will do something because it's difficult for me to imagine that an Israeli government, an Israeli government, will, for example, initiate a military operation against the Iranian nuclear uh, program when all its allies, actually the international community, concluded an agreement with Iran. It, uh, it is unthinkable. And I am not so certain also that, uh, that uh, Netanyahu will use what he thinks is his leverage through the U.S. Congress, the, 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 the Jewish lobby, etc. Uh, because uh, I think that after the conclusion of an agreement, uh, first of all, when you, when, you, uh, you, when you check it technically, it's very difficult for the Congress uh, to prevent the administration from complying with the, with the agreement because uh, of uh, 
uh, the authorities that the president is. And I don't think that uh, the, from the point of view uh, of Mr. Netanyahu, assuming that he will be the prime minister, and that is the, will be my last point, it, 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 is, it will be worth the cost of another conflict with the US administration. Now we are going to elections. And uh, the, my last point is what, what can be the, the implications of elections. <coughs> I would say that through the time of the campaign until March next year, uh, we can expect more rhetorics. Because at least for, for uh, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu and the right wing, uh, from their point of view, their force uh, lies in uh, the belief of the Israeli public that they are good in security. So they have all the time to project this image of being tough, being resolute, etc. So they will say very tough things, including threatening again uh, uh, attack of the Iranian nuclear program. Uh, but I don't think it would be more than that. Then the elections will come. And this time the elections are very, very interesting because everything is open. The status of Israeli public opinion currently and uh, the political map that we are having that is extremely fragmented uh, leaves place for all possibilities. So, so this time it's not a done deal. You know, there was an inclination in all the recent elections to say, well, there is a drift to the right in Israel public opinion. So we know who will be the, the prime minister at the end, Mr. Netanyahu. Not this time. The opposition to Mr. Netanyahu is very strong. His popularity and the way that, uh, that, uh, that the public sees the question, he is... Uh, is he fit to be the prime minister? Or are there better candidates? Uh, now he's de doing much worse than he did in, uh, in the past. So we can expect uh, surprises. And also very strange bedfellows because of the personal, and the, uh, uh, I would say, hostility of a large number of the different politicians that can be uh, political uh, can be candidates to be in a Netanyahu government towards a Netanyahu. Thanks. Suzanne, if I can go to you. You, you recently returned from Oslo where you took part in a series of Track 2 discussions that included Iranian uh, partners. Just I'm curious if you could share with us what you got from them with regard to their perspective on the deal, some of the key sticking points. Um, how they see, in, you know, in particular Congress and the way Congress has talked about and operated uh, pushing for more sanctions, how, how that registers with the Iranians you spoke to. Well, I think uh, first and foremost, louder, sorry, uh, first and foremost, I think the Iranians are quite um, feeling quite confident. Uh, they feel that they have demonstrated over the past year that they could abide by the interim agreement, and they've done that. The IAEA has confirmed it. Uh, as Shlomo said, not only um, have they uh, um, made some significant uh, changes to their program, but clearly they have uh, done a lot to um, uh, open their program to inspections. And now with this extension, uh, they are doing even more. So uh, with this new extension, they now are allowing IAEA to come in twice as often, and beyond that, also to make SNAP inspections. So <coughs> now the IAEA can come out, come in basically at will, and this really addresses concerns on sneak out more than break out, but any covert activities, um, getting a heads up on that. So uh, they feel that they have proven that they can be a reliable partner in any deal. And I think, um, to borrow Shlomo's words, Israel is on the same page, ultimately, at the, uh, as the U.S. on this issue, because at the end of the day, they don't want Iran to have a nuclear capacity, nuclear weapons capacity. The same can be true for, said for our allies in 
the Gulf region, our Arab allies as well. Um, they are very concerned more about um, whether or not the administration can deliver on what they want in exchange for all they're willing to do. Um, what we heard was a great concern, especially after the election, of whether or not um, the Obama administration can deliver on sanctions relief. Uh, they were also quite concerned that if they entered in a comprehensive agreement now with this president, uh, would the next president abide by that agreement? Um, I think that's something that they're thinking about. Uh, they're very concerned that some of the um, uh, things that they may agree to in a comprehensive agreement, uh, they call it uh, things that are irreversible. I think that's stretching it a bit. But let's take, for example, the ARAC facility, the plutonium facility in ARAC. One of the things they have put forward is the notion of removing its core, uh, which falls short of what the U.S. wants. The U.S. actually wants it converted to a light water reactor. But the Iranians say if they do that, um, in order to reverse that, it would take a good three years. So they consider that sort of an irreversible thing. Meanwhile, they know that the Congress here will not agree to lifting sanctions. The best they can get with this comprehensive deal at the beginning is a um, presidential waivers on the sanctions. So they're sophisticated enough to know how this town operates and how Congress works. But they're also um, quite concerned that they're entering into an agreement where they're going to be on shaky ground. And to a cer certain extent, I can understand that. But on the flip side is uh, they have, um, n you know, it wasn't until 2003 or so they didn't come clean about their program. They've cheated in the interim. Uh, so the onus is on them, to, I think, to carry the burden. And I think that's how this town certainly feels about it. Uh, beyond that, I mean, you can't have a conversation with Iranians purely about the nuclear issue anymore, uh, given what's happening in the, in the Middle East and the turmoil there. Um, so the discussion quickly also turns to uh, Daesh, ISIL, um, also the civil war in Syria, and even Afghanistan. Uh, a lot of concern about what's happening there. We can talk about that, those issues more in Q&A, but I think um, it's becoming more difficult to think about the nuclear issue as separate from all of these other dimensions, especially now when we look at Iraq. Essentially, uh, the U.S. and Iran are conducting military activities <laughs> in the same theater now against the same enemy. That holds a lot of implications. That's one more. I think one of the significant things we saw after the election of Rouhani um, was the very strong signals from the supreme leader of support for the negotiations and signals to more hardline elements that just to give them political space um, and support. Um, is that ongoing? Do, the, do, do they feel that that is still or is that shaky or what's the situation? No, there? I think they feel even more so that the leader even just m most recently, I mean he had some harsh words to say after the extension, but essentially through his support behind it, um, the other thing is, if you look at the many facets of the Iranian decision-making uh, system, uh, he has really cast a overall um, uh, kind of uh, mind meld <laughs> of discipline on the system where they're all coming forward in support of these talks, whether it's the Larjani brothers or Mr. Jalili or other parts of the more conservative elements. Um, now, looking ahead, if uh, things start going wrong um, and if, for example, new sanctions uh, come forward uh, out of Congress, then, you know, the Iranians turn to um, different scenarios where, uh, depending on the level of those sanctions, they would feel compelled to ramp up their nuclear enrichment capacity. Um, they may not let the IAEA have as much access as they're having now. They probably wouldn't kick them out, but they'll um, really limit that. Uh, and if it, things got really bad, then of course they would uh, have contingencies in place to undermine our interests in the broader region. Um, but I think the basic thing is that it's clear that this 
the interim agreement, the um, expansion of direct bilateral relations with the U.S., um, and the process of this negotiation have empowered the more moderate elements of, of the political system, Rouhani and Zarif and others, Shamkhani, Shamkhani and others. Um, and they make it very clear that without a deal, and a good deal for them, that uh, the radicals, the conservatives would gain more of an upper hand. And uh, I just don't, I don't think that's just talk. Uh, we saw that happen when this same team uh, in uh, 10 years ago tried to do this, and when they failed, uh, what happened to them being very marginalized. So I think there's some um, truth in that. Elon, you, uh, you bring a particular perspective, having seen this issue from a number of different points, first from the Pentagon, then over the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, and then most recently at State. When you look at the kind of sweep of President Obama's Iran policy, what are some of the things that, that jump out at you and some of the themes that you, you've seen? Well, <clears throat> I think, um, if you look at it, what I'd like to do is sort of talk a little bit about <clears throat> how the President is, how really from a U.S. policymaker perspective, <clears throat> how we've been handling sort of the relationship with Israel and also the relationship with the region <clears throat> in the context of uh, of these nuclear negotiations. And on Israel, I, I agree very much with, with Shlomo. I think part of this really is, <clears throat> it's about the Netanyahu-Obama relationship, but it's also, there is something bigger here. <coughs> that something bigger comes down to the fact that you know, we are strategic partners, we do work together, we do see the same threats. But the reality is the United States is a country of 300 million people surrounded by two oceans. And Israel is a country of 8 million people in the middle of what everybody calls cliche, a very tough neighborhood. Um, and so they see the threat differently than we do. Now, how does the United States address that? Traditionally, how we've addressed that <clears throat> is through a combination, really, of reassurance. Um, and also some quiet discouragement of things that we wouldn't like to see. Um, and I think that worked really well from, from 2009 to 2012. This reassurance, it comes in a, in a number of different forms. It comes in arm sales and things like Iron Dome. Um, and uh, it, it comes in very intensive strategic dialogue, both at the military and intel professional level, and also at the very highest levels of our government, um, where, where we really just, we talk about our assumptions, we sort of unpack a lot of these things. Um, we do it in a way that is incredibly transparent, uh, so that both sides, so that the Israelis, you know, they're never gonna be exactly on the same page as us, because they're from Mars and we're from Venus. But we can get really close, and that's what we've done. And actually, when it works well, as it did, I think, from 2009 to 2012, there's actually a useful role for the Israelis to play um, <clears throat> in being a little bit further out there. I think it played very much to our advantage to have the Israelis out there in 2011 and 2010 essentially threatening military action, incredibly, I think, threatening military action in terms of what it drove the international community to think about, in terms of the sanctions that it did drive, in terms of you know, the pressure that it then ended up putting on Iran, which has gotten us to this point. Um, <clears throat> But I think, you know, we've had a bit of a divergence here in, in 2013 uh, since the agreement on the JPOA. And I think it really comes down to two things. Uh, the first is, uh, I think the way the agreement was announced and signed was very important. Uh, you know, we had this moment of transparency, or, or we had this very long history of transparency, but we did have this moment where the United States pursued this very secret channel with the Omanis. The Israelis weren't exactly aware of. They weren't really fully aware of the deal. Um, and when that deal came out, Netanyahu had this very extreme initial reaction. Uh, and quite frankly, I think he has walked back from that to a great degree, at least internally, and in terms of the Israeli analysis, as Shlomo lined out. Uh, but you can't politically walk away from something like that. As a politician, you can't come out and say, bad deal, bad deal, worst deal ever. And then in the public domain, start to walk away from that. So he's continued to be out there. It's still the moment that defines the JPOA in the Israeli public mind in a great, to a great extent. <clears throat> the other thing is I do think there's a bit of a disagreement on, on tactics right now, where I, the Israelis, I think, would have preferred to see the sanctions stay in place longer, to not see the JPOA, um, and to essentially not see this breakthrough in negotiations, because they thought that if we had waited longer, the pressure would have built more and we would get a better deal. I don't necessarily agree with that analysis. The United States doesn't agree with that analysis. <clears throat> We've had a historic breakthrough for the first time in, in 10 years. We've frozen the nuclear program. 
and we have an opportunity for a negotiation. Uh, but this is, this is a difference that we now have with the Israelis that we didn't have for the previous few years before that. Um, and so how you manage it, I think the best way for the United States to manage it is, uh, you know, again, primarily through these very quiet, intimate conversations where we try to explain to the Israelis where we're coming from uh, through a combination of, uh, <clears throat> of arms sales and not offensive weapons, but defensive weapons and things that can really um, help reassure the Israelis. And also just sometimes listening and understanding matters. You know, if, you know, I mean, Shlomo went back to, you know, Israelis are from Mars, Americans are from Venus. You know, women and men are from Mars, women are from Venus. It's part of how you communicate is you just listen to the other side and you understand it. And I think sometimes, you know, as American policymakers, we need to be a little more patient and do, do more of that. Um, for the Israelis, I also have a recommendation on this, which is you got to keep working it through through the administration. You got to keep working it through the White House. You got to keep working it through these quiet discussions. Um, because trying to go to the Hill and trying to sort of undercut this policy um, by trying to get more sanctions from Congress just really undermines trust. I think it's, it's very bad for the relationship. Um, and it's very bad for, for the fundamental workings, you know, between the White House and the Prime Minister's office. So I think that that is you know, I, I know why the Israelis have, have sort of moved in that direction because, because we do have this rift. Uh, but it doesn't really work for them. And I, you can tell with the election coming up that there's a lot of parties in Israel that don't necessarily agree with this approach. I mean, Buzhi Herzog was here last week, leader of the opposition, and he outlined a very different policy on Iran, uh, one that talked about, you know, the United States and, and Israel sitting down together and talking about what the breakout time should be as opposed to one where there is no breakout time and there is no nuclear program, which I think you know, the United States considers unrealistic. Um, and so I think there is a possibility where we'll be able to work together with a new Israeli government, if there is a new Israeli government on that. If not, then I think there's ways to continue to work with Netanyahu to manage this. Um, on, on the regional, I'll just touch very briefly on, on the regional question too, in terms of the Saudis and, and especially the Saudis, but the Gulf states overall. I think they see things very differently than Israel does. I mean, so we have a different management issue there. It's less about the nuclear program. It's more about regional competition. And this is where I get a little anxious when, you know, thinking a lot lately about, okay, what, how does the U.S.-Iran relationship change in the event of an agreement? And how does this, this new, you know, ISIS threat change um, how we work with the Iranians? I would actually argue that we need to be very careful as we think through that. Um, there's some real opportunities. Um, I think, first of all, actually, the nuclear program should be our, our first, second, and third priority. I think, ultimately, you know, I know that ISIS is an issue for us, but it's actually a bigger problem for the Iranians, and we cannot give them the impression that they can get on the nuclear program by giving um, on ISIS, because I don't think that that's necessarily, that's not in our interest. I think we care more about the nuclear program. Um, two is I think there's some remarkable opportunities for cooperation with the Iranians, especially just in terms of Basic communication. I'll tell you, working this issue in the government for a number of years, if we wanted to communicate a message to the Iranians, 90% of the discussion wasn't what, it was how. And the answers were all really bad. Uh, through this intermediary, through that telephone, by the time the message gets there, it's, it's done. The fact that we actually have you know, senior American officials and the Secretary of State speaking regularly with his Iranian counterpart is potentially the single biggest breakthrough in terms of the relationship as opposed to any particular issue or any piece of cooperation. In the aftermath of a deal, what you really need to do is think about ways, and even now, think about ways to expand the communication across all levels. That's actually the single most important thing. Um, you know, on ISIS, I would actually argue, we need to be very careful and not start there because I think that in the aftermath of a deal, the, the Saudis are going to be very concerned that we're about to sell out their interests in the region, and our, as are the Emiratis and others. And the last thing, and we need them, we need them for ISIS. And the last thing that they're going to want to see is suddenly this perception that we're going really tight with the Iranians. But there are other areas for cooperation. Afghanistan, where we have a lot of common interests with the Iranians, uh, and where they supported the Northern Alliance, were helpful in 2001. Um, and I think will continue to be helpful in things like counter-narcotics and maritime security where I think we have a lot of interest in counter-piracy that are, that are joint. We have interest in making sure we have communication so we don't have an in inadvertent escalation in the Gulf. So there's a lot of areas that are ripe for cooperation and communication with the Iranians that don't involve also just fundamentally freaking out our regional allies, which is what we would do if, 
if we started working very closely with them on ISIS and would also send a signal to the Iranians that we needed them more than they needed us on that. So, a quick point. Sure. I, mean, I completely agree. I think the big news here is that senior Iranian and senior U.S. officials are talking yeah. on a regular basis. Uh, Secretary Kerry has Javad Zarif's cell phone number, and he occasionally uses it. That's a good thing uh, for all the reasons Ilan just mentioned. And I do think that, um, you know, when you look at the nuclear negotiations themselves, one of the things the Iranians tell you privately is, look, yeah. if we were just dealing with the Americans on this deal, it, we would have had it by now. <laughs> It's the multilateral aspect of it that's very complicated, and of course, that's what makes it so strong. Uh, I'm not saying that that shouldn't be the way it is. The fact that there is a, a coalition of partners is what makes this so strong. But I think um, in a short amount of time, we have seen American and U.S. officials uh, get a groove in terms of discussing uh, directly, and even I think these last meetings uh, in Oman and then in Vienna, just uh, Kathy Ashton did not attend the bilaterals in Vienna. It was just Americans and Iranians. So that is a positive development that I think both sides have found very useful and uh, hoping that that's the new normal. Go ahead, John. Uh, I, I would uh, like a little bit to cool down the enthusiasm from <laughs> from a possible uh, general improvement in the relationship between uh, Iran and the United States post-deal, assuming that there will be a deal. And why I'm saying that? I'm saying that because Iran has different interests. And Iran also has different perceptions than, uh, than we have. So you know that the, the, the assumption of the average guy it is that Iran wants a good relationship with the West. Why not? The West is rich, it's good economically, and so on. It's not necessarily true. There are strong elements in Iran that basically do not want a good relationship with the West. Because from their point of view, the West, with its, its culture, is the biggest threat to the Islamic Republic. And uh, unluckily, one of these persons is the supreme leader, Khamenei. He's not so enthusiastic about that. Uh, uh, so that is one thing. The other thing, there are interests. For example, uh, the interest in Iran in having this kind of relationship with groups like Hezbollah, Hamas, the Houthis in, Yum, in Yemen, and so, is so strong that it, it will not give it up for the purpose of now let's dance together with the United States. So I think there will be improvement in the relationship with the United States. There will be some cooperation. But it will be slow. It will take time with ups and downs. That's a, it's a good point, because it goes to one, another question I wanted to ask. I mean, what you said about, um, you know, it's, it's pretty amazing how unremarkable at this point the fact that top US and Iranian officials are talking regularly is. Um, and in my own conversations, you know, I heard them say exactly what you said, just the ability to sit down and talk with Iranians and just to understand mm -hmm. how they view their own interests, even if they're not the same. And I think Shlomo's point about kind of the different views about the benefits of a better U.S.-Iran relationship are, are, are very good. But I mean, I think this goes to one of the, the criticisms of Dip the diplomatic effort that we saw from some conservatives, which is that by sitting down with Iran, you somehow affirm mm -hmm. their views. Um, and we saw some of these, these criticisms um, against Secretary Clinton, I think last week in a, in a speech at Georgetown, where she talked about her vision of smart power, where she wor used the word empathy, nice. empathy with your adversaries, and she was attacked. But to me, you know, if you want to create better policy, you want to try and understand how your adversaries and friends and allies alike understand the world, how they understand their interests. Yeah. So looking at that, but not only Iran, but also we, we talked about Israel a bit, Ilan talked about our Arab allies. I just want to go back to Shlomo for a moment and talk. I think Israel obviously has concerns with the nuclear program, has concerns with Iran's support for terrorism and some other things that Iran is doing in the region, but I think Israel in general would not be overly concerned about a better U.S. 
Iran relationship. It understands that its 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 relationship with the United States is fairly strong and grounded in a whole in a whole range of things, whereas a number of our Arab, Arab allies do not see that in the same way. If you could just describe that, and then I'll go to Suzanne on that as well. Well, uh, you are right, of course. Uh, Israel, uh, Israel, by the way, and that is uh, in contradiction to the perception of many years, never mind uh, using diplomacy with Iran. Exactly on the, on the contrary. It was also supportive of the pl diplomacy. It always preferred reaching a, a diplomatic solution, and, uh, but it was thinking that for a good diplomatic uh, uh, solution, you need to combine it with pressure, namely sanctions, as well as positive incentives. They are also uh, legitimate. So that is the first point. Second point is Israel don't mind improving relationship uh, uh, between the United States and, uh, and Iran. Because I think that Israel uh, can trust the United States to, to try to use this uh, relationship to, to have influence on the, the Iranian policies. So they will behave at the beginning a little bit better uh, as it will envelop, maybe will change the approach also to the other issues that are between the two states. Uh, because I think that uh, the, 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 the Iran support for terrorist group is a problem also for, uh, for, uh, for the United States. I don't think that uh, the United States is in the list of the admirers of uh, Hezbollah, for example, and, uh, uh, and etc. Because, and I am coming back to the point that I made earlier, is Israel is hope that one day there will be a change in the relationship between Israel and Iran. And better U.S.-Iranian uh, uh, relationship can facilitate this change. But we have to understand, and I am uh, always uh, returned to that, it will be a slow and torturous uh, process. Yes. It will not be easy and not simple. And I, I, do, I agree with that. I'd Post-deal, I would not expect a complete rapprochement between our two countries. I think what we would see is some very um, discrete areas where there are some clear common interests that it makes sense to pursue uh, some dialogue and even some cooperation. And I think the point that post-deal, um, there will be parts of the Iranian system that are going to be very upset about what had just happened. Uh, their interests are going to be undermined um, because of the sanctions regime. We've seen um, certain elements of the Iranian system benefit from that economically. Uh, they're not going to want to give that up too easily. Um, and that's, and we don't know, we know the Iranian system has a dark side and sometimes the left hand and right hand don't work together. So moving ahead, we, if there was a deal, we, we should expect to see some bumps. They may be significant along the way um, and it might be hard to manage that. Now, if a deal was reached, it seems um, the administration has increasingly come to the um, conclusion that, let's take Syria for instance, uh, there is really no military solution at this point. It has to be a political solution. And of course, Iran would have a role to play there. So that would be one area where uh, post deal there could be some discussion. And again, not, as I said in a, rec a recent event on this subject, Iranians and Americans joining hands to sing Kumbaya, but really we have common interests there and Iranians have leverage there. Um, another area, of course, would be Iraq, where, as I said, uh, we're now operating together military, not together, but at the same time militarily. At the very least, communication about what each is doing in the area, and whether that's direct or through the Iraqi government, um, you know, as a matter of to be, to be uh, concluded. And then finally, I would say in Afghanistan, we have a situation where we have a new a unity government there that is very, very fragile. Um, there are, uh, you know, some significant common interests between the U.S. and Iran there in uh, making that government work. Uh, 
uh, bringing stability to that society, especially as we're drawing down our military presence. Uh, so that seems like a um, likely area where there could be some fruitful discussions. And just to reiterate the point, I don't think um, we should or could be doing all of these things without a nuclear deal. We really need to get that done first. Can I throw in a couple of things? One is I think important to just on the Israel versus Saudi Arabia piece, important to distinguish when we were talking about this earlier. For Israel, the priority fundamentally is the nuclear program. It doesn't care about the region, as Shlomo said. For Saudi Arabia, the nuclear program is actually not that important. What matters is all these regional places. So I actually come at it a little bit differently than, than Suzanne. I actually think that Syria and Iraq are a lot less promising for cooperation early on. Um, and the problem is precisely this issue with um, who controls the policy, the mo sort of is it Rouhani and Zarif, or is it you know, IRGC and guys like Qasem Soleimani? You know, and I think one of the things US policymakers are going to have to do in the aftermath of a deal is look at, are Rouhani and Zarif able to sort of claw back other areas of sort of foreign policy making inside of Iran? And those are the areas we really should be focused on. Um, and I see you know, Afghanistan as being a potential for that, because it's a lot less sort of politically loaded in Iran. But, but you know, Soleimani has been has pretty much controlling Iraq and Syria policy for the last few years. Um, and he still does. And I don't think that that changes in the aftermath of a deal. So you can sort of find some balance of cooperation in terms of deconfliction. Um, and you know, the, Ira the Iranians, if they're willing to take a new view in Iraq and actually say, um, you know, that, they're, that you know, the Iranian objective in Iraq right now is still fundamentally supporting the Shia. You know, this has not worked for them with Maliki, and it's actually caused Iraq to become you know, unstable. If the Iranians are willing to have a shift in a position and say, no, actually a federalized Iraq, where the, the Shia are first among equals because they're the largest population, and that's the reality of it. Um, and that's sort of US policy right now, is the only stable Iraq. If the Iranians are, are willing to look at it from that political perspective, then I think there's a lot of space for potential cooperation. But if they sort of keep at the zero sum ap approach in Iraq, then I think there's less. And in Syria, I, I, I do see that as very difficult at first. I mean, they, they're going to continue to support Hezbollah. They're going to continue to support Assad. Um, I don't see it's going to be very hard for us to, to cooperate with them. It doesn't mean there's not opportunities elsewhere um, and that we shouldn't try to at least find some common ground. But I really think the potential lies more to Iran's east mm -hmm. and, and, and sort of, and and over it in its waters than it does necessarily to its west uh, into that unstable area. So we've got about 35 minutes left. Um, I'd like to go to the audience for questions. Uh, do we have a microphone going around? Um, ah, here we go. Um, if anyone does have a question, please just identify yourself and if you could keep your question short and if possible, put it in the form of a question. Uh, this is a gentleman here. Andrew Steinfeld, Foreign Service Officer, currently uh, Foreign Policy Advisor to Chairman Martin Dempsey of the Joint Chiefs. It's a question for Shlomo. Um, there's been a lot of talk now. Um, I mean, what you mentioned was interesting, Israel's, the good old days with relationships and with embassy in Iran, for example, years ago. Um, but there's been a lot of talk now about a potential for um, warmer relations with the anti-Iranian Arab states. Jordan and Egypt are pretty well. It's in the security realm. They play the game of withdrawing ambassadors over the Temple Mount. But we all know that what's deeper is the very deep relationship between Jordan and Israel. Um, less progress, obviously, with the Saudis and the Gulf countries. Um, so basically, two questions. How do you juxtapose that with some notion of reestablishing a Persian-Israeli relationship against the Arab middle, and two, which you didn't mention at all, the role of the Palestinian issue, both vis-a-vis -vis reconciliation with the Arab states and potential step towards re reconciliation uh, with Iran. Okay, shall we accumulate? Yeah, well, go ahead. Okay. Uh, it's true that we now have uh, much more common interest with uh, uh, the so-called uh, Sunni pragmatic 
Arab states. Of course, not with all the Sunnis. We don't have common interest with ISIS. Uh, uh, and the common interest is the, the opposition to Iran and its nuclear program, and the opposition to ISIS and the, the Salafi jihadists, and also the opposition to the uh, Muslim Brotherhood, which, uh, which is the third category. So we, are, we have a common, common interest, and on the basis of that, there is thinking uh, that uh, maybe more cooperation is possible between Israel and the, and, the, and the Sunni states. And the main question is, can we have a relation that was over the surface, that will be over the surface, not only under the surface? Because under the surface, I think we have a relationship with, for example, some of the Gulf states for many years, including uh, economic relations, security relations, and things like that. But it was always limited to this kind of uh, covered relationship. I think, because of another part of your question, uh, the, the Palestinian issue, that the real uh, potential for uh, uh, a real change in the, the relationship with these states is very much limited. As long as we don't solve our problem with the pa 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 Palestinians, or at least as long as we don't make serious progress in our relationship with the Palestinians. Because all of these regimes, there is one thing that is common to them, it was true before the Arab Spring. It's, uh, it's now even truer after the Arab Spring. They are afraid of their own peoples. So they will not do things that their people would, wouldn't like uh, unless it, it is uh, very necessary. And uh, this kind of improvement in the relationship with Israel is not very necessary. So they would not like to provoke their public opinion that cares about the Palestinians. Now, uh, concerning the, the tension between relationship with the Sunnis and the relationship with Iran, uh, well, that is what nations are doing always. It's also a question for, for the United States. Let's assume that there will be some input, there will be an agreement, there will be some improvement in the relationship with, uh, with Iran. How it will deal uh, with its relationship with the Sunni Arabs, with the Gulfis. Well, it will have to, to, to invest uh, resources and efforts uh, to, 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 to at, le uh, at least uh, make uh, them abandon these conspiracy theories that now uh, the U.S. is going to Iran and it, it is throwing them under the wheels of the bus which is not true. The United States is not going to do it. The same is true for Israel. It, it will have to maneuver be between them. How did we maneuver, maneuver for years, for example, uh, between our good relations with Turkey, when we had uh, uh, good relations with Turkey, and our wish to at least keep, if not improve, our relations with the Kurds that are uh, traditional allies uh, of Israel. We did it. We maneuvered. Ilan, do you want to pick up on that point? Well, just on, on, the, on the Palestinians for a minute, since I just spent a couple of years working on, on this issue. Um, huh? With, with great success, <laughs> yes. Um, or with some interesting frustrations. Preparing for great <laughs> <success>. <laughs> But I do, I do think part of it is, it depends on the election in Israel, is another big piece to remember here. Because I think the Arab states, they see the common interests, They're like as Shlomo said. Um, there is a formula where you know, there's very little that the Palestinians can actually give to the Israelis that the Israelis actually want. This is part of the fundamental problem in the negotiation. Um, but, there is a f but the Arab states have something that the Israelis want, international recognition, integration into the region, much more. And you see it in the public. You see it in Netanyahu's rhetoric. You see it in Lieberman's rhetoric. You see it across the Israeli public. You saw it throughout the negotiations. There is a formula where the Arabs come to the table and sit with Israel in a public way. Uh, and in exchange for that, it gives more flexibility for an Israeli leader to give more to the Palestinians. 
that's the basic formula. Arab give to Arab states give to the Israelis. Israelis give to the Palestinians. Um, that is not going to happen with Netanyahu. Um, it's not going to happen with Netanyahu because I don't think any of the Arab leaders actually trust him enough that he will give to the Palestinians. Um, and it's a personal thing, uh, and, and and a risk aversion thing. It's just the fact that, that he is you know somebody who's I think they feel like they've been burned by him in the past, and so. If you did have a new Israeli leadership and a new sort of center-left government in Israel, um, which I do think is a real possibility, actually, I agree with Shlomo's assessment on that, uh, then I think that formula actually becomes very interesting in this, in this regional situation right now. Sir, why don't we go to the gentleman here in the second row? Yeah, Ken Meyercourt, World Docs. Uh, don't you think, uh, even if there wasn't a nuclear issue, we'd still have sanctions on Iran? Well, there are sanctions on Iran uh, for, uh, related to terrorism that are separate from the nuclear sanctions, so yes. But those sanctions don't involve cutting off half of Iran's oil exports, which actually dramatically hurt their economy. So you'd have sanctions. It just wouldn't be nearly the same level Not of sanctions. Uber sanctions. Right. Um, the gentleman right behind you. Thank you. Ali Dot Mafi Nezam, West Asia Council. My question has to do with the general idea of thinking of an American presence in Iran. Mm -hmm. And uh, by that, I don't just mean an official U.S. embassy there, although that's a good goal to think about, but the presence of U.S. institutions, whether it's universities, think tanks, foundations, NGOs, and whether you think any thinking about such things should wait until the nuclear deal is done or not done, or whether you think thinking along those lines can only enhance the likelihood of a successful nuclear deal. Thank you. Well, uh, on the official level, uh, I believe it was in, was it 2009 or uh, some years ago, um, there were actually plans, the State Department had plans uh, to place American citizens to work in the U.S. interest section in Tehran, uh, which is located in the Swiss, yeah, the right, and that, they, uh, that interest section is located in the Swiss embassy in Tehran. But that was being worked for us through Russia, and then the war in Georgia happened, and it kind of scuttled all that. So there is a plan, uh, at least written up, to move in that direction. I think at this stage, it's probably too early to think which direction that would go. To th maybe to think about that, but on the, the side, what you're talking about, the more civil society side, the, um, you know, make no mistake about it, there is a very strong Persian diaspora in this country. Uh, and they are actively thinking, they're going there, they're trying to build these sorts of relationships so that they can, they're thinking post-deal of the potential of doing that. And I think that's a really good thing. When we think of the last 35 years of hostility between our countries, I mean, one of the things that makes me certainly uh, the saddest is the fact that our societies have been so, so um, forced to be detached from each other. So I think people-to-people uh, -people exchanges, we're seeing more of that happen in a limited way already but exchanges of scientists, uh, more student exchanges, exchanges in the fields of arts and culture. Uh, these are natural things that I think um, would happen uh, once a deal is made. And people are trying to push those boundaries and that envelope now, too. But I think it's still very difficult to get traction. Um, certainly, a cooperation between universities is another area where I think there's great potential. Um, so I think people are thinking about it. More creative people are actually trying to get these up and running. I know uh, several people who are working uh, very quietly to uh, start having discussions with business leaders from both countries. Um, that's very sensitive at this stage. But uh, so I think you know, the direction you're talking about, if there was a deal, it would be inevitable and it would probably bloom pretty quickly. One quick point just on something the United States government could potentially do. I, I agree with Suzanne completely that even the interest section is probably too soon uh, right now. But you know, the United States does and has had a long-standing no-contact policy with 
with Iranian diplomats, which is still essentially in place except for the nuclear program, I, I think you can start finding ways to make that more flexible very quickly. You know, I mean, if an Iranian and American diplomat show up at a counter-narcotics event in the Czech Republic, then the Iran there's no reason they shouldn't be able to, you know, have a couple drinks or, or no. you know, non-alcoholic <laughs> no. drinks. There's other reasons for that. But, uh, you know, and, and have a conversation um, and begin doing things like that. There's, I think, a, a low-risk, easy step that, that can be helpful to just start building normal relations. If I could just go off on that for a minute. Going back to something Shlomo said, I think, I mean, yes, people-to-people, -people, institutional, academic exchanges would be great, but I think there is a tendency in the Iranian government, I think Hamene himself is part of this, that sees those exchanges as a threat, as a cultural threat. So, um, and I'm gonna reference something that my, my friend Meir Javed Anfar has said, and I know he's watching because he was tweeting about this, uh, where he said that some of the things that have gone on, such as the upsurge in arrests and executions, could be seen as a f an attempt at containment of a kind of a signal from Hamene and some of the other hardline elements to say to Rouhani and Zarif, okay, you can succeed on this file, but don't get any ideas about expanding your reach. Absolutely. We've seen a rise in um, capital punishment, significant rise in Iran. That is certainly a signal, I think, to Rouhani and moderates and the public at large who voted overwhelmingly for him that they're still in control. I think the arrests of journalism like journalists like Jason is another way they're sending a signal. So, um, you know, I don't want to give the impression that the deal's going to be signed and all of a sudden things are going to be great. No, this is going to be hard. Um, on a dip the diplomatic level, uh, you know, it's going to be difficult on uh, the people-to-people -people level. I, I should have mentioned there's also been a very um, active and productive uh, inter-religious exchange between religious leaders from the U.S. and Iran now that's been going on for a while. That's been very constructive, so I, we'd probably see more of that happening. But, um, you know, all the things that you've just mentioned, Matt, that's what I think I was alluding to before. There are going to be elements of the society that are going to push back hard. And one big question we have is, you know, if this nuclear deal happens and Iran is um, reintegrated with the global economy, that's going to be a significant force. And the big question I have is uh, the internal um, changes that will take place, the expectation of the Iranian people, uh, what kind of impact will that have on the society? I think when you talk about these questions, I would assume Hamene thinks about these things. Um, and, you know, those sorts of forces, once they're unleashed, are very difficult to manage. Uh, and I think those things are probably uh, being weighing heavy on his mind and certainly uh, his colleagues. Um, the gentleman right in the red. My name is Faizan Irij. Uh, I wanted to address my question to Shiloma. Um, I think you start with a very good um, premise. That, that uh, Can you explore that a little farther? Because I think m much of the problems we're dealing with in this region is psychological. We have a lot of paranoia. We have a sadomasochism in some uh, aspects. And the the interest and in that conversation really uh, clouds and and uh, distracts us from the psychosis analysis, and how can we deal with with uh, with these problems? How can we find a therapeutic track, really, for both individual actors and collective psychosis? Because until we deal with that, the rest isn't just going to happen. Like well, a, a therapeutic track. <laughs> can we do that? Well. <laughs> Well, quite a number of years ago, I think it was more than 20 years ago, uh, a wise politician in Israel said that what uh, the Knesset, the Israeli parliament, needs is a good psychiatrist, <laughs> and that everything would have been better. But, uh, well, well, I think <laughs> that what you should do, and that is connected to, to what Ilan has said, well, we should... Uh, try and at least in democracies elect the right people. Mm. <laughs> you know, you know, <laughs> you know not, not, not all people are the same. Some 
with some it is easier to build trust. Uh, and uh, I think <laughs> it has to be a consideration for any voter. Uh, because, uh, you know, all these things of people to people and so on are very nice. And I have much experience with these things in the, in the, uh, in the area of our relationship with the Palestinians. Mm -hmm. But uh, you can invest, you know, work and time, etc., for years on people uh, to people, and it works very nicely. And then one decision of a politician and everything uh, collapses immediately. And I don't uh, have a solution for that. Okay. Um, this lady here, and then the gentleman. Why don't we take a few questions, um, this lady, and then we'll move over down that aisle. Hi, I'm Sarah from the Center for Arms Control and Nonproliferation. Uh, do you think the currently tenuous relationships between, relationship between Russia and the U.S. is affecting the negotiations in any way? Why don't we take one more right here? I'm Milton Honig from the International Center for Terrorism Studies. Uh, you seem optimistic about the possibility of a, an agreement uh, by March 31st. Um, tell me, were you surprised by what happened on November 24th, uh, not having an agreement, but a fairly long extension of the joint plan of action? Shlomo wrote something, I think, on November 17th about that. Um, what do you think about the possibility of an extension, another extension, uh, in lieu of the status of the Iranian economy? Um, Alon, do you want to take that one? And then maybe we can go to Suzanne for the, the Russia question. Sure. I mean, I'm, I'm of the view, I'm actually not overly optimistic about the idea that we're going to necessarily get to a deal. I'm in the middle, but I was really quite stunned when actually we got to the first deal. So I've since become more optimistic about the second one. Um, but I do think that in terms of an extension, um, there is a real scenario where you sort of go towards what I call Japoa forever, um, which is essentially, you know, I mean, right now the Iranians have frozen their nuclear program. They're two months away. That's better than the last 10 years when they've been building up their program. They're getting limited sanctions relief for that, but they're still under a lot of pressure. They're relatively comfortable in this situation. We're relatively comfortable in this situation. So if you can't get to an agreement, the just perpetual extension approach is not a bad one. Uh, the danger is with the perpetual extension is how long can you keep the spoilers at bay from undercutting the entire thing? Um, and here, the most likely spoiler, especially as time goes on, is Congress. And if it were to pass legislation at some point, even if for now they're OK, if at some point Congress just gets fed up and passes something that includes new sanctions, the Iranians walk away from the deal. International sanctions start to fall apart because you know, the international community views it as the United States tanked this deal because it, it violated the JPOA by passing sanctions. There's also Rouhani, who's fending off the hardliners in Tehran, and how long can he do that? And at some point, does the Supreme Leader stop listening to Rouhani and say, you know, no, actually, we're going to go back in a different direction? So I think continued extensions are a preference to a far better than a breakdown where Iran starts moving on its nuclear program again and we head towards potential confrontation um, or, or just a moment of decision that I think is best left avoided. Um, but there's a lot of external pressures that could cause that to, that to collapse eventually. So I, I still think the best approach is to actually try to get that breakthrough to a final deal. I think the extension on November 24th wasn't a huge surprise. Um, I think a lot of people saw it coming, even though, by all accounts, they got pretty close to a deal. Um, like Alon said, maybe there would be another extension in July 2015. I think particularly the pressure on Rouhani would start to become, would start to wear. Because let's f remember, he ran on a platform of uh, improving the economy. And although we see unemployment and inflation uh, improving, uh, with the current uh, state of oil prices, I mean, the, Ira the Iranians just, Rouhani just presented his budget for 2015 this week. And in it uh, accounted for oil at $70 a barrel. The last budget, it was at $130 a barrel. 
you know, that is a significant change. Uh, the other thing is, is in this budget, he hasn't included anything, um, any uh, upswing from sanctions relief. So it's a very realistic budget. But you have to think, how long can he continue to have the leaders support if the um, improvements to the economy are not significant? And what, you know, th this last extension, in terms of the west side, we actually got some significant uh, improvements, <coughs> some extra uh, requirements that I think were quite good. We didn't mention, uh, you know, the, this, this um, the Iranians agreed to uh, uh, suspend um, uh, research on uh, advanced centrifuges uh, to some extent, also laser technology, which many people saw as a loophole in the joint pl program of action, joint plan of action. So uh, I think maybe the next extension could work, but it would be stretching it. It's not a, it's not a solution. Now in Russia, um, what senior U.S. officials have con consistently said in private about Russia is that they r really are playing a positive role in the discussions. Um, uh, I talked to a senior official just last week who made this point. Uh, it seems that the um, uh, problems that we're having elsewhere in the relationship have not trickled in to the negotiations. Could that change? It's possible. It's the other point that we haven't raised is um, with another extension on the, on the U.S. side, uh, you know, we might start to see cracks in the international sanctions coalition. Could we continue to bring Russia, China, and others along? I question that. Let me take a couple more questions. The gentleman in the back here. Uh, Charles Abrams, uh, retired physician, uh, observer on the scene. Just trying to figure this out. Uh, Iran is a terrorist state. Um, their long-term plans, I'm trying to figure out, uh, would involve uh, supporting Hamas and uh, Hezbollah. Is there any linkage in any of our discussions on the nuclear program in trying to stop that support as part of reducing the sanctions that are already in place? Is that part of our plan? And if it isn't, why isn't it? Mom, do you want to take that? <clears throat> Not specifically. The nuclear negotiations are focused on Iran's nuclear program, not on its activities um, supporting Hezbollah and Hamas. Um, but I do think that, um, you know, I, some believe that if we can get to a deal with Iran, uh, those issues could perhaps be discussed and tackled. Um, some years ago, I believe it was in 2003, there was a um, grand bargain proposal floating around town here that the Iranians um, theoretically put forward, where it did include uh, discussion on Hezbollah, their support for Hezbollah and Hamas. Could we get back to that? I'm not sure. Um, but I think the administration and the P5 plus one was very wise when they um, set the framework for these negotiations to only focus on nuclear and get that done with. That's the immediate foreign policy uh, priority. Uh, and I think if they had included a lot of other things in the mix, we probably wouldn't be uh, made the progress that we have today. Awesome. Just, uh, I also if uh, the Supreme Leader could assure Israel that he wouldn't annihilate them, would that be a helpful step in moving the nuclear disarmament type of conditions here? Because I'm sure that's one of the sticking points as far as Israel's concerned. It, it will improve the atmosphere for... Uh, uh, but uh, I don't think it will have uh, uh, much influence on the negotiations because uh, uh, I don't think the reaction will be okay. Khamenei now said something else, so now we can trust him completely. Yeah. 
He can have his nuclear weapons. It's okay. He will not use them. It doesn't work like that. I, say, I think that basically in diplomacy, when you are having negotiations, some of the things that you should do to build mutual trust is also use assertions of this kind that, uh, that uh, can create more trust. But it's only, it, it, it will only improve the atmosphere. It will not have uh, influence on the substance, on actually the subjects of the negotiations. Well, and you had started to. Well, just one thing. I mean, you know, I think as Suzanne said, you know, it's not just an issue of complexity, which I think is right, but it's just, I think we care a lot less about Hezbollah and Hamas than we do about the nuclear program. Like the nuclear program for us is a major strategic issue. Hezbollah and Hamas, much slower on the list. Um, and the idea, I think Hamas, the relationship between Iran and Hamas is not really that important to the Iranians. The relationship between Iran and Hezbollah is a long, historic, it's not going anywhere. It's going to be a problem with, with, with them, with or without a deal. Um, but, you know, that's okay if, as long as they're not building nuclear weapons, as far as I'm concerned. Um, we're still going to disagree on that, and we're still going to have some conflict over that. But, you know, that's, that's acceptable. Um, okay. Um, why don't we just take these last three questions, if we can make them quick, uh, last round of questions here, and then we'll... Um, my name is Autumn Weidman. I'm a student. And so my question is, with the recent Senate uh, release of the CIA reports, will this uh, negatively influence uh, the U.S.'s ability to negotiate with the nuclear deal? Uh, Edison Dirk Foundation, Middle East Peace. Well, what are the sanctions that the uh, Iranians most want to get rid of or most damaging to them and from, from the U.S. and the EU? And conversely, what, what sanctions would the U.S. Uh, be most flexible on to, you know, sort of, sort of um, <coughs> uh, be willing to give in on? And the gentleman right in the back there. Hi, thanks. I'm Nathaniel Sobel from the Astiano Abraham Center for Middle East Peace. And uh, just to follow up on a uh, question over here, um, I was like in a discussion with a former Israeli diplomat uh, just the other day who made the calculation that if Iran really wanted to bomb, They'd be wise to tone down their rhetoric, rhetoric about Israel because it inflames the international community. And the conclusion he reaches is that maybe the, uh, the top leadership in Iran isn't exactly rational. Um, how would you evaluate that assessment? Um, so let's see, we had three, the, the Iranian rhetoric and rationality question, the impact of the torture report, and then uh, Eddie's question about what are the, some of the sanctions Iran would prefer to have removed immediately. I can take, uh, I can take, I'll take sanctions. I'll try that one. Um, <coughs> yes, all right, why not? Um, I think the biggest sort of division right now in terms of sanctions is on, <coughs> the Iranians would like to see, what the Iranians really want is the oil sanctions first and foremost gone. And I think you would see that not lifted altogether immediately, because those are U.S. legislation. What you would originally see is the president probably sign some waivers that essentially lift those sanctions. So they can be quickly snapped back into place if there's violations in the agreement. This is going to be a sort of step-by-step -step approach where over time, as Iran takes steps on the nuclear program, the sanctions come off. So, but the first big thing you want to do is see the oil. Now, where the biggest disagreement right now is in the negotiations is on the UN Security Council uh, sanctions. Those are not as you know, hard and those are not as, the way you to think about UN Security Council sanctions is a little bit like just the general broad framework you know, sort of like a Supreme Court ruling, and then based on that Supreme Court ruling, you have all kinds of, you know, implications down the line in terms of how different countries implement sanctions. It basically provides this big political cover that allows a lot of countries, especially the Europeans, to then implement the sanctions that have come afterwards. Um, and the reason the Iranians have sort of pushed on those is because they see them as reversible. In other words, they think that maybe we can, that's some, some place where they can move pretty quickly. It's also an opportunity for them to divide, try to divide the Russians and the Chinese away from the E3. Um, but the P5 plus 1 is very hesitant to go there early on on the UN Security Council sanctions because once you lift them, I, it's very hard to see how you put them back in because the Russians and the Chinese aren't necessarily going to vote for them. I mean, one I interesting idea that I've heard from friends in the administration is maybe <coughs> there's a new resolution that actually, 
puts in place, yeah, it supersedes all the sanctions. It puts in place, it basically ratifies the agreement. And as part of ratifying the agreement, it describes a step-by-step -step process of how the sanctions come off. That's one interesting idea that's out there, but you know, I think that is still one of the, uh, uh, apart from sort of the overall uranium enrichment piece, that's probably the, the stickiest point remaining in the negotiations. Uh, just to follow up on, quickly on this sanctions point, when you ask the Iranians why uh, suddenly they are very intent on getting the UN Security Council sanctions lifted immediately, it, they say that it has to do with principle. They say the UN Security San uh, Council sanctions are what started this whole mess for them. Uh, from that, the EU sanctions and the U.S. sanctions emanated. So they see it as the foundation for this uh, unjust regime, sanctions regime against them. And I think that's part of the thinking. Um, now getting on to the other question about the torture report, would it have any input, uh, impact? I don't think so, although I haven't checked Hamani's Twitter feed today, but chances are he's probably tweeting about was, this, uh, just, just as he was tweeting madly about Ferguson and all these things. So I think, of course, um, not only with the Iranians, but I think other countries in the world, this does present the United States with a dilemma in some of its negotiations, not just on nuclear, but others. But I don't think it'll factor in um, in any significant way. And then finally, uh, whether or not the top leadership in Iran is rational. You know, there's the mad mullah theory uh, that I've never found very convincing. I think if you, there's been a lot of good work on this, by the way, um, uh, research and analysis. If you look at the uh, Iranian regime since the revolution, uh, you know, I see a very rational regime that's focused on its self-preservation and has done quite well in managing to preserve that power uh, over time. So I um, would say that I think it's a very rational regime. And even with these negotiations, you know, even when you look at the end of the um, Iran-Iraq war, there's some very fascinating analysis of um, the leader, uh, Khomeini then drinking from the poison chalice, uh, the way he put it, to put an end to that war. That was some rational thinking going on there. And maybe uh, we're seeing that now with the nuclear program. Maybe they've come to the decision that it's costing them too much. Uh, I don't know, um, but I would uh, think at least those sorts of discussions are happening. So I want to thank you yeah, all. I, oh, sorry, Shlomo, I want go to ahead. say something about the the Med <laughs> uh, about all the discussion of rationalism. Uh, you know, one has to, to, to define very carefully what does it mean by rationalism. In my opinion, rationalism p uh, means the, the, the capability to, to, to make a calculus of costs and benefits and to operate accordingly. Now, what people usually are mistaken is when they think that the values of the other uh, party are identical with your values, and because of that, benefits and costs are the same to us as they are to them. Because the real question is, what is the source of uh, the Iranian hostility to Israel? You may say it's ir irrational because it is based on, uh, on uh, uh, religious beliefs or something like that. But I think it is completely rational. It is completely rational because of two reasons. First of all, religious beliefs are important. And they are important in a regime that is based on being the Islamic regime. So, so their claim that they should be the rulers of Iran is based on the notion that they are operating according to the, the Islamic uh, principles. So religion for the regime is something very rational. That's uh, one point. The other point is that I am, I think for many years that the hostility to Israel, to Israel basically was very useful for the Iranians, because that was their way to find inroads 
into the Middle East, which is mostly Arab and not Iranian. So they are in a disadvantage if they want to influence the Arab world, because Arabs are not uh, so enthusiastic about Persians or Iranians. But their hostilities to Israel was goods that they could market very successfully in the Arab Middle East. I just want to take a moment. Um, Suzanne mentioned Jason. Uh, that's Jason Rezaian, a Washington Post reporter, American Iranian, who's been held now for 141 days in uh, Iran's Evin prison. Um, I don't know if any Iranians happen to be watching this now, but uh, I just want to encourage our our government to continue to press for his release and to make it clear that we have not forgotten Jason and we hope that he will be released soon. So uh, thank you all for joining us today. Um, this has been a great discussion and thanks to the panelists. Thanks.